you have your Bibles with you this morning, let me encourage you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we are going to look at a couple of verses. You know, there are some terms that we use in church life that we throw out a lot, just assuming people know what they mean. Uh, and if we're not careful, sometimes we're using terms that we think they know what we mean, but they may not know what we mean. And if they don't know what we mean, then we're not communicating what we intend to communicate. Don't ask me to repeat that. For instance, I had a friend that um, did not grow up in church and uh, came to church for the first time and we sang a song. Man, how many of you remember this song? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilt and stains. And this person was horrified. It's like, is that like a scary movie? And so this morning we are gonna look at this concept of the body of Christ. What do we mean when we say the church is the body of Christ. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, the good news is we're only going to cover two verses this morning. The bad news is that has no bearing on the length of the message. <laughs> so if you have your Bibles open to or clicked on or turned on to or spoken to, however it is that you get there, if you would join me in reading this, would you mind standing in honor of God's word? If you're able, if you're not, we certainly understand that. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, help us as we strive to understand this concept of, of being one in you and yet being many. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. By the way, just so, uh, just so we uh, understand, that this concept is, that we're gonna be talking about this morning is understanding the body of Christ. Understanding the body of Christ. Because again, when I was in school, our English teachers had a rule. If they asked you to define a word and you used the word in the definition, you were in trouble, right? So what does it mean to read? Well, reading means to read letters, uh, no, nah, you violated already, you're done. So we said we're gonna try to understand the body of Christ and yet this verse uses the very concept that we're trying to understand so we need to unpack it a little bit. First of all, we need to understand that all believers make up the body of Christ. All believers. Now. I understand in this world in which we live, where we divide up into our little houses of worship, that we might wrestle with the body of Christ being all believers across all denominations. Now, don't, don't hear me say that every person who goes to a church is a believer, because we know that's simply not true. Not everybody who goes to this church is a believer. But we also don't want to fall off the side of the truck that says, well, since we disagree with a particular church or their doctrine, that no one in that church can be a believer because that would be equally wrong. There are believers in churches and the body of Christ makes up all of them. But not just this way, but this way. All believers of all time. The Apostle Paul Believer, part of the body of Christ, right? Peter, disciple, had foot and mouth disease, part of the body of Christ. If the Lord tarries, whoever comes next, part of the body of Christ. And so this idea of the body of Christ is that all believers make up the body. Look at Romans chapter 12, verses four and five, and I think it's gonna be on the screen here for you. Just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Now, what does that mean? So everybody, hold up your right hand. Is that part of your body? All right, so put that one down, lift up your left hand. 
Now obviously, that is the opposite side of your body. It couldn't possibly be a part of your body, right? I mean, you can't even grasp things the same way. You need an opposite to go with it. And yet, it's the same. So our eyes are part of the body, our ears are part of the body. All the different parts of our body, although they retain an individual function and an individual identity, combined together to make up the body, our body. And I think that the reason that Paul gave the Romans that instruction so they would understand it is because some of us need to think in pictures. By the way, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. We said last week that God loves variety, and I believe that. Look around the room. Again, when I give these instructions, we will move faster if you'll just do it. <laughs> Look around the room. There's a lot of variety, right? Some people are tall. Some people not at all. Some people have hair. For some, there's none there. And yet, we make up the body because we became a part of his body at our conversion. Now, this, there's a unique kind of situation in our day, and it is unique to our day. And that is this, that I can become a follower of Jesus and just do my own thing. I don't need anybody else. I've got the internet, I've got books, I've got whatever. I don't need anybody else. I can do, do this Jesus thing as a Lone Ranger. That is foreign to the Bible. Now, the, the reason for that is, I think, is that we as Americans, especially, have a freedom where we don't, like the first century, give up who we are when we can become a follower of Jesus. Let me explain that. If you were a Jewish person in the first century and you became a follower of Jesus, you would be removed from the synagogue. We know that story from the New Testament because you remember the man that was healed? He was blind and he was healed and he went and, and the, the synagogue rulers got real upset and wanted him to know, hey, who's this one who healed you? He said, it was Jesus. He said, oh, it couldn't be him. He's a sinner. He said, look, whether he's a sinner or not, I have no idea. What I know is I was blind and now I see. They called in his parents. Remember? Because he said, well, maybe this isn't the guy that used to beg. Maybe this isn't that guy. And they asked the parents, is this, is this your son? And they said, he's my son. But as far as who healed him, you talk to him. He's old enough because they'd already decided they were going to throw everybody out who followed Jesus. So if you were a Jewish person and you followed Jesus, you were basically dead to your family and dead to your society. There was no place to go to, to buy and sell. There was no place to go to have friends or even family. Well, if you were Gentile, which means not Jewish, and you became a follower of Jesus, you were kicked out of the trade guilds because the trade guilds were all dedicated to a particular idol or false god. And so whenever they got together to have their meetings, there would be sacrifices to these false gods. And whenever they ate a meal, the, the food would be offered to the false gods. And then they would eat together in celebration. And so if you became a follower of Jesus, you, it was no longer okay to worship idols. And so you had to say no. So then they said, well, you no longer are part of the guild, which means you no longer have a job and you no longer have an association with which to ply your wares. As a matter of fact, even today, in some countries around the world, if a person comes home and announces to their family they become a follower of Jesus, the family will have a funeral, a public funeral, and proclaim to everybody, this, this child of mine or this wife is now dead to me. I had a friend, no, I've told you this story probably before, if I haven't, he, he went, when he became a follower of Jesus in Iraq, he was given a choice. Leave now with only the clothes on your back and we will marry your wife to someone else that's a good Muslim and your children will call him their dad or we'll cut your head off right here. See, we don't, we don't have that. 
We, we, we become a follower of Jesus, and normally what we tell kids at vacation Bible school or camp, or do you know if somebody's going to be excited about this decision you've made? As a matter of fact, when someone gets baptized, that's a question we ask. If you're a friend, a family member, or just really excited about this, this person's decision to follow Jesus, would you stand up? And everybody stands up, and they're like, yeah! So we don't... I hate to say it this way because it really isn't true, but in our hearts, I think at times we feel like we don't need each other. But you know, I've had, I don't know, a dozen surgeries now, I think. And anytime they cut on any part of me, the rest of me hurts. I think we need each other. I think we need each other. When they cut my right elbow, my left hand had to learn to do stuff it had never done before, and my left hand is stupid. I mean, I, I literally had to brush my teeth by holding the toothbrush and going, eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
How many of you would, if your kids just didn't come home one night, you'd be like, well, you know, they probably got some things going on. I don't want to be in their business. You know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be that person. No, what would you do if your kids just didn't come home one night? You'd be on Life 360 trying to find out where they are. You'd be on the phone trying to call them, say, where are you at? You'd be texting them, get yourself home. You, if they didn't come home after a while, you'd be out looking for them. If you couldn't find them, you'd be calling the police. You'd have helicopters and dogs and laser fences and I don't know, whatever else. The thing is, if your kids didn't come home, you'd be out making sure they got home. And if we belong to each other, we ought to not just let each other disappear. You say, but what, what will be able to think of me? I don't care. If I wake up one morning and my left arm's gone, I'm finding out where it went. Because <laughs> I would be incomplete without it. So we are members one of another. And, and we, we looked at this last week just briefly, but 1 Corinthians 12, 18 tells us God has placed each member in the body just as he wanted. Now, this will tell you how, how unimaginative I am because look at this actual verse. But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body just as he desired. <laughs> All I know how to do is read the Bible. But here's what that tells me. I said last week, and I, and I say this and I'll continue to say it as long as I'm your pastor. There are no extras in God's movie. There is no body, there is no body that is expendable as far as the church is, is concerned. We need each other and every one of each other. That's one of the reasons, I said this last week, but, and I know I'll keep referring to last week, but the two are very related because we're in the next two verses. But when someone comes to join a church, I get pumped because I'm saying, okay, God's about to do something in their life. And man, we get to be a part of that. We get to see it happen. But also God has something he wants to do here that we need them for. Say, oh, great, well, I'm not joining that church. They'll give me a job to do. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I mean. I mean, there's, there's something, sometimes there's a passion that you might have that the church needs. Maybe you're, you're a new believer, and some of us that have been believers for a while need to be reminded of, of that feeling of the first time we prayed, and we knew that our prayers did, didn't just hit the ceiling and come back down. They went straight to the heart of God. There's some of us that are they're new believers that we need you to remind us of the excitement of sharing Jesus with people and seeing the light bulb go on and, and anticipating that they were going to be upset with us and instead finding out that they needed exactly what we had to say. The excitement of opening our Bible for the first time and knowing that this is not a dead, dusty, old, anti antiquated book. This is the very word of God from the heart of God to ours. We need that reminder at times. But you know what else? Some of our new believers need to hear that it's not always candy and roses. Sometimes it's with tears streaming down our face. Even when my heart is torn, I will praise you, Lord. We need the, the senior adults that can remind us that it's just as important to praise God when our brain has ideas our body won't carry out. We need the example of the younger adults that remind us of maybe I do have something I can do and everything in between. We need the kids. We need the kids because they're not just the future of the church, they are the church. We need each other. 
And God puts us together in these churches, and I believe it happens on an individual level, but I also believe that God's put, God puts churches together. That's why we associate with other churches through our association. God puts those churches together because there's some things that we can do that others need help with, and there's some things they can do that we need help with. And God puts that together. And since it's his idea, it's always going to be better than my idea. But we also need to realize that the body of Christ has a purpose. The body of Christ has a purpose. And although it's not in the correct order, look at Romans chapter 7, verse 4. It says, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another to him who is raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. The purpose of the body of Christ is to bear fruit for Christ. Luke 19.10 is a verse I, I hope that we all have memorized. If not, let me encourage you to work on it. It's pretty easy. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Here, you know, I'm, again... I'm kind of a simple guy. If Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and if we're his body, what ought we be doing? Seeking to save the lost. That's that fruit. Now, it's not just the lost being converted that's fruit, but it's not less than that. What does the Great Commission say? Go forward, preach, teach, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. What are those good works which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them to seek and to save the lost and to produce fruit for him? So if that's what the body of Christ is supposed to be doing and if each member is a part of that body, then each member of the body has an important part of that purpose. I don't know why you're getting so excited about this, but because here's the deal. You have friends that wouldn't give me the time of day. Let me, let me tell you how this works. I was at a funeral one time. I was, I was uh, kind of hanging around. I never lead with, hi, I'm Pastor Jack, or I'm whatever, um, because it's amazing how people, the walls come up. <laughs> like, you're Pastor, I'm not talking to you. I was at a funeral one time. I was talking with this lady in the lobby before the service, and the funeral director came and got me. And when he said, Pastor, you ready? She got this horrified look on her face. And she began to apologize profusely. I am so sorry. I didn't realize you're a pastor. Here I am just taking up your time. I said, you need to just stop right there. You don't need to apologize. I have enjoyed our visit, and I am so glad for the opportunity to get to know you. But there are people that you know, friends that you have that would say, Pastor, because they've had experiences. And I know we like to think or used to like to think that pastors are great people and we held them up on his pedestal and they're, they're are always honorable. But we, you know, some of the worst credit risks in America are pastors. I hate to say that. And the last time I had my car worked on. I went in to get an estimate. He called me and said, come get your estimate. And I said, now, before you give me the estimate, just realize I'm a poor preacher. He said, I know I was at your church yesterday. <laughs> so <laughs> some of y'all get that later. Um, but unfortunately, pastors sometimes are not those, and people have had those experiences, and they don't want to talk to a pastor. But they'll listen to you talk about how God has changed your life. So each member of the body is important and an important part of that purpose. Because just as we read last week in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each one is given a manifestation, manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. 
And the proper functioning of the body requires all of those members and all of those members to be doing the part that they've been called to do. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 21. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. All the, the parts of the body are needed. All the parts of the body affect all the other parts of the body, just as we said at the beginning. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Can you imagine this? How many of you have ever gotten any kind of award? You're like, I'm not raising my hand, that's self-centered. No, I asked you to. Raise your hand. Some, I know I'm looking at some people that have got some awards. Come on now, don't be. All right, yeah, see, can you imagine this? Oh, look, I'm getting an award. Leg, you stay there. We'll be back. No. All the parts of the body affect all other parts of the body so that when the body is honored, all the members rejoice with it. When, when anything good happens in this church, guess what? You're part of that. When anything sad happens in this church, you have a part of that too. That's why Paul said to the, to the Romans, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But living as a part of the body requires transformed thinking because we've been taught to think it's just me and Jesus. Just me and Jesus. And while there certainly is true meaning that a relationship with Christ is always a personal matter, that God doesn't have any grandkids. If I could believe for my kids, I would. How many of you would do that? If you could believe for your kids and ensure that they would be in heaven with you one day, would you do it? Absolutely, we all would. So while it's a personal matter, there's no question about that, it's never a private one. Because we're in this together. But the world teaches us, just take care of you. Just focus on you. Just worry about you. And, and maybe the world will give us the a leeway to say, well, maybe it's just you and your family. Right? Just you and your family. We do this, right? How many of you remember back in the days before air conditioning? Some of you do, all right. Before air conditioning, where did you normally spend your evenings? Outside, on the porch, on a swing. What were you doing while you were out there doing those things? Talking to everybody else who was out there doing those things, right? And then we created this thing called air conditioning, for which I just want to be honest, I'm thankful. But you know what happened all of a sudden? We went inside our houses, we closed our windows, we closed our doors, and we got st stuck in this mentality that it's just about me and my castle. To the point where some of us don't even know our neighbors anymore. Now, I understand if the next neighbor lives 10 miles from you. And there might be some here in that situation. But we, the world wants us to think, be isolated, be individual, be alone. When the body says, we all need each other, we're all connected, we ought to be together. Romans 12, 1 and 2, verses we probably know very well, say, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. If we are going to grasp this concept of being part of the body of Christ, it has to start in our thinking. But it can't stop there. Because how many of us have good thoughts about Jesus? How many of us struggle sometimes to get those good thoughts about Jesus out into actions for Jesus? It can't stop there, but it has to start there. 
The expression of the body of Christ in our community is the local church. There is no question about that. It includes bodies, the body includes believers of all time and stretches across denominations, but its local expression is here in this place. Acts 20, 28 says, be on guard for you yourselves and and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The body that he has in this place, he bought with his blood. Let me ask you a question real quick, just real quick. How many of you would consider something valuable if you bled for it? The body of Christ is valuable to God. That's why Acts 20, 28 says, be on guard for yourselves and all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So this concept of the body of Christ is foundational to church. And we've got to get to the point where we grasp it and we share it and it becomes infectious. Not like TJ would be if he was here, but so that it becomes attractive to others. Here's the the crazy thing. I know we're, we're about done, I promise. Here's the crazy thing. In our world today, there are, there's an epidemic of isolation and loneliness. There is. And, and we think we're more connected than we've ever been. Because I have, I don't know, I think I have 1,200 friends on Facebook. How many of you have lots of friends on Facebook? Yeah. But isn't it amazing that we can have all those friends on Facebook and still feel alone? Well, part of it is because everybody else shows us their highlight reel and we compare it to our normal everyday life. But it's also because those are virtual. They're not real. Now, some of them are. And some of them are people that we know in real life, but for the most part, they're people we have known or are connected to from across the way. But there are people around us every day that feel absolutely alone. So much so, did you know that it is a now listed officially in the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, which is the manual they use for um, psychological uh, evaluation. There's now an actual Uh, dysfunction where people have become terrified to answer the phone and talk because they have to have an unrehearsed conversation that they were not prepared for beforehand to have. Now we laugh, some of us laugh, but what people do is they'll let their calls go to voicemail so they can hear what it's about so they can decide, A, if I'm going to call them back, or B, what I'm going to say when I do. Why? Because we're so isolated and lonely that we're afraid of saying the wrong thing and eliminating the thing we want the most. Now, don't get me wrong. There was a time in my life when I didn't answer the phone and I let it go to voicemail, but that's because I had bills I couldn't pay. But these are people that just, their mother calls. I'm not taking the call because I wasn't ready for that conversation. There are people that get up in the morning, go, especially in the gig economy, they go through their day, they go to bed at night, and they haven't connected with one other single human being. And we have a, the privilege of a connection to one another as the body of Christ, to belong to one another, to enjoy one another, to encourage one another, to lift each other up, to serve one another. There's some people that desperately, desperately need that. But you know what they need more than that? More than they need us? They need him. And so that really brings us to a question as we close. 
Number one, are you part of the body? Have you ever at any point in your life realized your need for a savior? You looked at your life and you said, you know what? I've not lived a perfect life. I have sinned. And I know that if I have to fix myself, it will never get done. And coming to that realization, which comes from the Father, have you cried out to Jesus and asked him to forgive you, to take off the robe of your selfishness and unrighteousness and put on you his robe of perfection? Have you surrendered to him to say, you be the boss of me, you direct me, or I'm going right back where I just came from? Have you become part of the body? If you have not, can I share with you some good, good news? Today could be that day. Today could be the day that you don't have to walk alone anymore. You can find a family, a body to belong to. But maybe you're here today and you say, well, I, I know I'm a follower of Jesus, so I know I'm connected that way, but maybe you've moved to this area Maybe, uh, maybe you've just kind of been trying to find where you belong and you find yourself coming back here time and time again. And maybe that's God's way of saying to you, I want you to be part of this family, this body. And maybe you just need to come and say, how would I do that? What are those next steps? Or maybe you are a part of this body but you've come today with an incredible burden on your heart and you're carrying it by yourself. And maybe it's time that you came and shared it with somebody so they could pray for you and with you and be the body together. In just a moment, we're gonna have a time that we call the invitation. That's a big fancy church word for simply, if you're here today and God has tugged at your heart about something, we wanna give you an opportunity to come and tell somebody about that and say, what, what do I need to do? You would step out from where you are, walk down a few feet of carpet, talk to one of our elders who'll be here at the front, and they'd be glad to visit with you. I'm gonna pray for us first, but as I, as I ask that question, are you a part of the body? Maybe another question you have is what part are you supposed to play? And you say, I don't know. Here's a great thing. You ready for this? You know how you find out what part you play? Real deep theologically. Try stuff. Try stuff. Say, so maybe I could help with something. Let's give it a try. Maybe it could be a part of that. Come on. There are a few things that we have some, but other than that, come on. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you this morning and I thank you. As I look around this room, I see, I see men and women, boys and girls, and I know, I know some of them, but I'm new here and I'm still learning people. But what I see when I look out into every one of these faces is a man, woman, boy, or girl that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die for. And some of them, some of them have become followers of Jesus and part of that body, and some have not. And I pray, God, that you would bring them to that point this morning of, of wanting to be connected. Father, some of them are ashamed because of sin in their life or struggles or addictions. And I pray, God, that this morning you would tell them that you, that's the very people you sent your son for. And so, Father, I pray that people would come, become part of your body this morning. 
But I pray also, God, because I know that some of us are doing this thing by ourselves. We may drop into church or maybe we've dropped into this church time and time again, but you're tugging at hearts this morning to say, come, become a part of this body in this place. And I pray that you give them the courage to do that. I pray also, God, because there are parts of our body this morning that are hurting. And we need to stand together. And so give them the courage to come and admit their need so that we might pray for them and with them. Father, we pray it in Jesus' name.